I can guarantee you, you've never played a game like this before. It's a reverse tower defense auto battling deck builder and it's actually incredible. Now, you've almost certainly played a Devolver digital game. They exploded onto the publishing scene with Hotline Miami, and ever since, they've been championing indie games that are all kinds of weird and wonderful. Unlike so many publishers, generally speaking, seeing Devolver's stamp on a game is a proof of quality. Well, maybe quality is the wrong word. I think it's more a guarantee that you're going to have an interesting time, and Loop Hero is no exception. It can be an awful lot to take in, but look at this. It's a beautiful symphony of moving parts, once you understand it, and the game just leaves it all in your hands. It actually trusts you. Now, as I said, it's like a reverse tower defense auto-battling deck builder. The only interaction you actually have with the game is placing cards from your deck and then equipping gear. Everything else happens automatically. As the hero is going through the loop, you have to design the world and how it challenges the hero, and you do that by placing cards. Those cards drop from enemies, which get stronger with every finished loop. The hero, on the other hand, gets most of their stats from gear, which usually of course drops from enemies, which means that you need to place enough enemies to actually keep your hero's strength up, but not so many enemies that your hero gets overwhelmed and killed and once the world has been filled up enough, the boss will spawn. Goal number one, of course, is to be strong enough to defeat that boss. Goal number two, and here's where the roguelite element comes in, is to gather as many resources as possible to bring back to your camp. Your camp, of course, provides respite, access to new cards as you progress, and eventually some bonuses. A few major ones, but they're mostly things that help with your early game strength. And through this, an infinite attention-grabbing cycle is born. It sounds simple enough, yes, but the beauty of this game is in its depth. You see, placing enemy spawners in the path is like walking a tightrope. You place down one or two more enemies than your hero can deal with, and it starts to go very wrong indeed. But if you don't place enough, then your hero won't get enough loot, and they'll start to struggle against future enemies. That's far from all that happens, though, because you can also place landscape cards, which help build out the world while usually providing power to your hero. But again, it's not quite that easy. Place too many of these, and it will add in, say, an extra enemy spawner of a specific type. And that means that every card that you play is part of a delicate balancing act. And then the actual placement of these tiles is important too, thanks to a host of adjacency mechanics with the tiles, many of which are just left undocumented and up to the player to find out. A great example of this is the Vampire Mansion. It adds vampires to fights on adjacent tiles. But if it's beside a village, well, the vampire will then ransack the village, turning it into a difficult tile full of ghouls. But then, after three loops, it will become the Count's Lands, which is essentially a massively upgraded village, now prosperous thanks to the vampire's rule. So, it's got this great risk-reward mechanic, but also, it squeezes in a lot of really cool world-building at the same time. So, where you place tiles is important, but guess what? There's actually more. The types of enemies that you're spawning matters because they all have different damage profiles, interactions, and abilities. You've also then got to consider what stats to prioritize when picking equipment based on what enemies you've spawned. You'll need decent defense and damage to all to deal with the weak but plentiful rat wolves, but against, say, tough single skeletons, you'll need evasion and magic damage. You've got mechanics like this, but of course applied to dozens of enemy types, the current boss, and three different classes of hero, each of course with unique mechanics and even stats to think about. You're not just placing enemies and letting the hero have at them, you're designing a level that challenges your hero and you're trying to build him so that he can just about win. Anything less than that and the boss will put a violent end to your run. This is a cacophony of genres and mechanics all mashed into one, but the devs have miraculously managed to make all of this work. If just some of the numbers behind the scenes were slightly different, 
The whole game would fall apart, but it doesn't. It just works. Every time something goes wrong, you can see how it was in fact your fault. And then, of course, that will give you ideas for your next run. And that really is the power of a limited tool set, but one that has a massive amount of depth. And that really is why this game is just so fun to play. The game is difficult, taxing even, but experimental. It requires all of your attention, even though most of your time spent in the game is just watching and thinking. Make no mistake, this is an auto battler, but it's far, far from an idle game. You constantly have to pay attention to see how your hero is handling the fights and then add more to the map when it feels right. And when I say that this game is addictive, I mean it. This is one of those games where you can lose hours without realizing it because you are just so engrossed. You are solving puzzles on the fly with a tool set that's narrow but extremely deep and for hours on end. And when it goes wrong, you instinctively want to try again but tweak a few variables. Loop Hero is an absolute win on gameplay but it gets even better. Everything else comes together to make for an amazing experience. From the second you boot the game, the outstanding pixel art and opening themes sink their teeth into you. And the atmosphere is engrossing and it sells you on the setting, a surreal cosmic apocalypse mixed in with some simple dark fantasy. Your hero is just a young man clad in armor with a sword, but he's piecing reality back together through fragments of memory. It's a neat setting. The music is also stellar. The expedition and camp themes just sell the grim reality of the world while still being perfect to listen to for hours on end as you play. The boss themes then keep the same dark feeling but ratchet up the intensity and like all good boss music, the fear and adrenaline kick in right away. Then there's the dialogue. It's hard to describe but it's just right. The hero conversing with enemies is so good that it feels like an actual gameplay reward for discovering a new enemy type. Then the bosses. Despite only having a few lines of dialogue each fight, each one is fantastic. You can feel the weight of their character. The setting itself is crazy and hard to make sense of, but that's actually part of the journey that you go on with the hero and the characters at camp. So as a package, this is all significantly more than the sum of its parts. Like all truly great games. So, what's the story here? What's the story behind this game? Well, it's a simple but pleasant one. A group of four Russian dudes, four quarters, have been working on small games together since 2013. The Loop Hero itself actually began as All Ideas Do, a conversation. As the story goes, the developers were just having a conversation about weird ideas, specifically zero-player games, and a little hero walking around a circle was one of them. Then Ludum Dare 45 came round in October 2019 with the theme of starting with nothing, so they dredged up an old idea and got to work. And as expected of a hastily made Ludum Dare game, it barely worked, had minimal gameplay, and yeah, in a way you could say kinda sucked. But the point is, they continued with it, and they got a very basic alpha going. At this point, it was called Loop at Hero, and it was actually received extremely well across social media. In fact, it's still up on Four Quarters Itch page, so you can actually give it a try. And it's that version where the core of the game was born and proven. So, with it being born and proven, they sent their pitch deck over to Devolver. The first person at Devolver who saw it said that they saw potential but wasn't totally sure until they sent the build around their internal team and everybody got hooked immediately. Uh, from there, Devolver and Four Quarters worked together to make the game happen and well over a year later, it released to explosive success. Look, it's no Valheim, but thanks to word of mouth and the free demo, it's up there on the charts. The game actually went from a relatively quiet launch to 500,000 sales in just one week. Its soundtrack is also Devolver's fastest selling, which is an insane thing to say given its competition. Hotline Miami, Katana Zero, The Messenger, and more all incredible soundtracks. That's a massive achievement for a game that looks so complex and impenetrable 
on the surface, but it deserves every sale and more. Four Quarters managed to take a terrifying cocktail of mechanics and blend them into what I would actually call a masterpiece. And it's a pretty awesome story of a little game that could. I mean, basically, there's no drama, there's no adversity to overcome, it's just a great idea, beautifully blended mechanics, and a hardworking team. And their work actually doesn't stop there, because since launch, they've pushed over a dozen patches, fixing minor bugs, rebalancing things where balance issues are spotted, and they've actually promised a long list of updates. So there you go. This is a game that came across our team on Steam. Matt played a lot of this game, was basically hooked on it for days and days and days. And now in this new era of the channel, where we're a lot less just chasing the headlines, well, it's time to actually talk about bloody good video games and things for us all to be excited and passionate about. So I'd say you owe it to yourself to give this one a try and you can take the demo for a spin to see what you think.